loving this crowd. See, you guys get better stuff. I've been a stand-up comic for 20 years, and I actually decided I'm doing a documentary where I was kind of letting go of different things in my life. And I did 90 days of just no-cooked food. I said 90 days of no-cooked food. I announced to my friends, I said, if you see me eating anything cooked, I'll give away $10,000. And it was kind of a cool leverage thing because the, like a cookie would come by, and usually when you, you're like, I'm going to go raw, and then you, but you don't make an announcement like that, and a cookie comes by, and you're like, yeah, one bite won't hurt me, and the next thing you know, you've eaten nine bowls of ice cream, and you're like depressed and watching Dr. Phil way too much. So what happened is, I said that, and then that was, the, that was the coolest thing, so I let go of that, and I let go of all these other things, and then I said, I'm now done taking comedy clubs on the road, because I feel like I have more of a purpose doing this, performing a place like this, getting consciousness out through comedy, and I think that it's so important that, yeah, I think that it's so important. I believe very, very sincerely that we all really have a purpose, and I believe that all of us have things in our lives that are slightly in the way of it, and we know it, and we can always just keep letting go of it. And it's scary, but I can tell you one thing, when you let go of that thing, you can tangibly see what you're gonna be losing. Right, you go, oh, well, if I let go of that, like if I get rid of fa Facebook, I can't, you know, read an annoying post about someone getting a haircut and comment that I like it. But like, <laughs> so it's scary to let go of it, but you have no clue of what you're gonna gain on the other end. And the more and more I let go of stuff, like in the documentary, there was a moment where I said, I'm done taking comedy clubs on the road. And I, right when I said that, three auditions showed up into my phone in that minute. And, and then there was a moment after that where I was wide open. I felt freer and I was like, whoa, I'm trusting my purpose and everything. And then I, my buddy Jason Moffat, who's a marketing genius who's in here, I don't know where he is, but I was like, oh, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of David Wolf. This is a true story. So I wrote down on a piece of paper on the documentary, this is all I wrote, contact Jason Moffat about seeing if I can get in touch with David Wolf. The next day, Jason Moffat contacts me and says, David Wolf's in town, do you want to do an interview with him? This is a true story. There's no, there's no exaggeration. And, and so next thing I know, I w David Wolf's in my house for two and a half hours and we talked and became good friends. And it was only because I just was like, oh, I'm gonna do that. You know, I'll just do that. And I'm starting to realize that it is so easy to do it. I started looking at more things like, you know, what Gandhi did, we could each do. And could you imagine if 10 Gandhis showed up at the same time? Just 10 of you. 90% of the room doesn't have to do anything. Go ahead and take a break. Ten of us are going to do something. <laughs> Ten of you, that's it. And you know what? If it's 20 of us, we only have to do half the stuff Gandhi did. <laughs> that means you can still date. <laughs> Just date half as much. So if we go 40 people, we only have to do one-fourth as much as Gandhi. And he didn't have the internet. Realize he was like putting letters on pigeons and like hoping, you know what I mean, that it would go to the right guy. Well, he had the secret, so he's like, it'll, it'll be there. But like, <laughs> manifested it. But I'm starting to realize you can do anything. So I want to tell you this story and, and tell you a couple other things. But I remember last year, Comedy Central had a contest where they put out their 100 favorite comedians of all time. The greatest comics in the world are in this list. And I had learned so many things from so many amazing speakers, including David, and I kind of just asked myself, how can I win this? That was the question I asked. I've really learned that if you ask can I, you get yes or no, period. And if you go how can I, there's a given. So anything you want to do, literally say how can I. Now I know you know this, and you're going to love the next joke, so you might not want to go, unless you're going, if you're having a BM, that's okay. <laughs> that's my, yeah, there you go. Are you wired? Okay, good. Are you wired up, because then... So, but I asked, how can I win this? There were enormous con comics in this contest. Like Chris Rock was in it and Larry the Cable Guy and all these comics. And I said, how can I win this? Now, just so you know, the contest had started and the public was allowed to vote on the comics. So it was just up to the public, right? Now, every other comic was sending a uh, thing out to their email list going, vote for me in the thing, vote for me in the stand-up showdown. I said, how can I? So when I asked, how can I? I got, well, what if you do a podcast and you thank everybody by name in the podcast for voting for you? So I started doing a motivational podcast every morning. I announced that I would do that, and like 400 people said, I'll vote for you in the contest. So then I did this motivational thing, and I didn't have any fast forward options, so they had to sit through me motivating them. And then <laughs> at the very end, I started thanking like 400 people. And, and I was just going, I'd like to thank blah, 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 blah. And I was making it fun, and all my friends were going, what are you doing, dude? Doesn't that take like 20 minutes to thank like 400 people? That's how so many people, that's how our competition thinks. 
That's 400 people. That's gonna take 20 minutes. You could be watching a sitcom, dude. I'm like, yeah, or I could make 400 fans for life, right? I could change their life. Just by saying their name, like they get a sense of significance, right? They get a sense of like, hey, friend, look at this. So I thanked them, and then at the end I said, just so you know, I'll be doing this tomorrow. So they got all their friends to listen. The next day, all their friends were listening, and they said, I'll vote for you too. And the first day, I jumped from 18th to 8th place in the contest, and there were still two weeks left. I was like, oh, man. This is so crazy, right? So the next day, I was like, vote for me. Uh, again, and I did another motivational thing. And now the people the first day are getting all pumped because they're being motivated, they're hearing their name again, and the next day I think like 800 names, right? So I just sat there and spent a little time having fun with it, making it funny, doing all this stuff. 800 names. Next day I went from eighth to sixth place, and there were still like 12 days left in the competition. And I kept going, and it moved up every single day. It was like 1,600 names, 3,200 names. I was creating this enormous following just by giving a little bit and letting go. I wasn't even looking for the results. I was just really into thanking them. And I really want to say, if you have a, a fan base or you, you're marketing to a group of people, just take care of the people you have. Don't try to get more. Take care of the people you have. That's what I'm starting to get. Take care of the people you have. Their word of mouth is so much more powerful than trying to get more. Because what what's the value of all those other people if you're not there for them? So just take care of the people you have, and then those people will be like, this guy's awesome. And you're like, okay, and then you can take care of them too, and it's awesome. So I got down to the last week, and it was myself and the famous comedian Jeff Dunham. And we were neck and neck, right? Now, Jeff Dunham, just so you know, is a, is a great comic, great guy. He has four, uh, like 400 million added up YouTube hits, okay? Now, what's really crazy was Comedy Central was about to release his TV show. So they wanted him to win. So what they did was the last week, they put his special on six times. And every commercial break said, vote for Jeff Dunham. And they pulled my special off the last week, OK? So my fans were going crazy, right? And this is what I said. I said, this isn't a problem. It's a test to see how bad you want it. Everything in your life is a test to see how bad you want it. There are no problems at all. So I told my fans that, and they got extremely excited, and it was Jeff Dunham and I neck and neck. And what was really crazy and just blew my mind was the fact that my one second idea that came from the question, how do I win this, changed national television scheduling. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Do you get how much power we have? We have so much power, and it's so annoying to be around people that don't know it. You, you know when you hear these people going, oh, the change is coming and the conscious shift, do you get they literally mean just you? <laughs> like, they actually, yes, there's other people that do it, but if each of you go, oh, they literally just mean me, you, then you'll take full responsibility, and you'll get excited. It'll pull you. You know what I'm saying? So, so they said this, and, 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 and Jeff Dunham and I are going neck and neck, and then the last night, Jeff Dunham and I were tied, and so they had one more day of voting, and the last night, they ran Jeff Dunham's special four more times from 8 p.m., 10 p.m., midnight, and 2 a.m. And my following was like, not a problem. Like, they became this Obama-esque, like, <laughs> we're going to win this thing, and all of a sudden... And then the way they tell you who won was on Sunday, the following Sunday, they run the specials of 20 down to one, and, and that's how you find out. And I just remember one day hearing from the East Coast, Jeff Dunham's in second place. And I realized that one idea, I won the Comedy Central stand-up showdown as the number one comic of 2009. And, and I only, I tell you that because it kills me to realize how much power we have and how, if we know that we have it, how much we have to use it. Like, it's, I, I, I forgive the people that don't get it, you know, but we know this. We know that we might, you know, that radiation's coming in here. We know that there's all these different things, and we know that there's all these people that actually think McDonald's. We watch Super Size Me. This guy goes to McDonald's for 30 days, almost, almost dies, and then America looks at that and goes, I guess I'll eat half that bad. <laughs> that should be good, half that bad. Almost kills me in 30 days. So I always say, what happens if you go the other way? And I know that's your mentality too. How, wh how, why, when people say to me, this is my philosophy and no one else has to take this, but when people say to me, I believe everything in moderation, it's kind of like they're saying, I think we should live somewhere between our unlimited potential and where society has put us into conditioning as a consumer. I believe that you should be living to your unlimited potential. 
I don't understand why people would want to average that out. I don't understand that. Because, because it, it's, you think that you're just giving up that thing, but you don't understand that you're doing this, right? This is all you're doing for your life. Like, look at 2010 and just go, wow, how many unnecessary dates did I go on that could have been writing or developing a bigger fan base or creating something more? Just li you know, it's just like, wow, just so I could hook up with that girl? Like, I don't even, she wasn't even great. You know, like, <laughs> it's not worth it, you know? So, it, but it goes like this if you don't do it. And I've realized what it is. It's the news. That's the biggest thing. Because the news only tells us bad things, right? Do you know how not scared of flying we would be if they told us about the 30,000 flights a day that made it? <laughs> With the same breaking news intensity, I think every single time a plane lands, they should interrupt whatever crappy show you're watching <laughs> and interview every person as they're getting off the plane. Because that also happened. So that's really impressive. In fact, way more impressive than the planes that didn't. So I think every time a person gets off the plane, they should be like, how was it? And he's like, it was fantastic. I had a really nice time. You'd be like, oh, that's cool. That's news also. That's what happened. They're like, coming up, a family that wasn't murdered. You'd be like, oh. <laughs> Even murderers would be like, well, if no one else is killing people, why would I, you know? I should start a job and fix the economy. But they don't. They scare you for 58 of the 60 minutes, right? 58 of the 60 minutes. And then the last two minutes, they act like they were friends the entire time. <laughs> right? That's how they trick you. Because the first, first 10 minutes are like murder and guns and torture. Prozac commercial. Hmm. That's timely. More murder and everything. And then the last two minutes, they act like they were friends because they tell you the story of a cat that got stuck in a well. <laughs> Every single news story ends with a cat that got stuck in a well. I think the news is putting cats in wells. <laughs> so they can scare you for 58 minutes and then finally be like, talk about nine lives. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go live to the scene and there's this obese woman stroking a greasy cat. We thought he was a goner, but it turns out he wasn't. <laughs> and then they come back and they're like, and the cat's name was Lucky. <laughs> sure was, Bill. And then they're doing this. They're stacking papers, but they have a teleprompter, so I don't even understand why they're <laughs> stacking papers. <laughs> because they're lying. And I'll leave you with this last thought, because you can see the lying in all their advertisements. Does the Pillsbury Doughboy just show up in people's houses and start dancing around their counter and everyone's okay with it? It's so weird, it'll just be in their house like, Nothing says I'm loving that my toaster strudel. <laughs> and the lady's like, oh, Pillsbury Doughboy, it's so normal you're here. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a weird two-inch tall guy on your counter with no hands and feet. And he's excited about nothing, right? They're just pulling cookies out of an oven. And he's like, cookies! Like he can't believe cookies come out of an oven. <laughs> First of all, what a jerk. That's his friends in there. That's his friends. <laughs> in the oven. You guys are all friends of mine. If anyone pulled you out of an oven, I won't yell cookies. I'll be like, David or Angela or late doctor, get out of the oven, it's hot. But the Pillsbury Dome is like, stay in there, because he's a jerk, don't hang out with him. You guys, thanks for letting me be a part of your event. I'm Kyle Cease, you're wonderful. Thank you very much. Take care of yourselves. Let's change the world, huh? Let's give it up for Kyle Cease.